Hey golfers, and welcome back to the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. I'm Drew Mahold, joined with Michael Geiger today. We got a lot of fun things to talk about. It was a fun weekend of golf. Uh, a couple of fun tournaments were on television. Um, I know we took those in quite a bit, but we also have some, um, some fun questions and comments from the audience, the listeners, the viewers as well that we want to get to. But um, I also want to remind you guys about the tour van fittings available at Second Swing. Playing better doesn't have to come from hours and hours of practice. Optimized equipment could be all you need to shoot lower scores. At Second Swing, our award-winning master fitters use state-of-the-art technology and world-class training and knowledge to dial in golfers every day. Whether you're a beginner, seasoned pro, or anything in between, you will save strokes with a Second Swing Tour Van Fitting and schedule that fitting today at secondswing.com. Michael, uh, good to have you back in. Uh, for those that listened or view or are watching, um, obviously know Michael was on our last show talking about handmade sticks. Um, we have Michael back in because a you're just you're you're a golf fan and you like golf you watch golf um, and so uh, I guess we have the Mexico Open we have the LA Championship over the weekend as well in the LPGA but um, did you get to play any golf this weekend or no was I did not get to play any not golf get to? Okay. no, no. The, the the weather was not super we're not there quite yet here in Minnesota being able to go out there and uh, I I did play golf but it was not the best experience weather wise how'd you play like, it was like. 50 degrees. It was windy. I, I survived. Uh, it was I, I played as well huh? as I expected myself to play in those conditions. But it was very breezy. And I know there's today's actually today's Monday, the, the first we're recording this and there's a lot of uh, US Open local qualifying going on. And at least from what I know outside right now, it is a windy, cold day for that. So good luck to everybody participating in that. Um, we got to get to the Mexico Open though, uh, because we, have, we saw Tony Finau, one of our, I think, is he the most likable guy that wins on PJ Tour? He's got to be darn close. His <laughs> approval rating, I would imagine, is, is just about 100%. I, I can't imagine, you know, not everyone's for everyone. You know, I don't right. expect everyone to like Tony Finau. I can't really imagine too many people dislike Tony Finau. I don't, there's not, I don't think there's a reason that, like, he's never given anybody a reason to not like right. him. I mean, especially after... Uh, the Netflix show that kind of focused on him, the episode. I mean, there's there's no reason not to like the guy. And so, and there was maybe reasons to doubt him as a winner up until about last summer. And then he wins four times in nine 18 months. 18 starts, I think it's. Yeah. yeah, I think it's like four wins in 18 starts. Yeah, I, and he did it in convincing fashion. I mean, he put up 24 under par. Uh, so I guess, what did you see from, from his game? What did you see from that win? Does it say anything more about him? I mean, I know the field was super strong. Tony, F I'm really fascinated by Tony Finau's career because while in the last, as you mentioned, since last summer, this kind of year and a half range, uh, he's definitely gone up a level. The, the strokes gain data really kind of mm -hmm. bears that out. But by and large, he's, he's not too different of a player than he was at the beginning of his career when he seemingly couldn't win anything. And he would mm -hmm. always put himself in contention, and he and he never picked off a trophy. And then, all of a sudden, as, or so it seems, he picks off four um, very quickly. And I think it's it sounds very obvious, but with the exception of you know, I feel like there's players like Max Homa that seem to win whenever they're in contention. There's and Brooks Kepka is a, is a good mm -hmm. example. Whenever he got in contention at a major, um, the past five years or so, he just won. Yeah. It, it's it's very obvious, but the best way to win is to just put yourself in contention a lot, and that is what Tony Finau yeah. does. And I think there's there's kind of two sides to that argument. One is you know if you're a Finau loyalist or, or fan, you're kind of saying he's been unlucky, and he and you look back and he has in some instances been unlucky in some of his close calls. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's the other half that says, well, when's he gonna win the big one? Why 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 can't he come through when it matters? You know, uh, but winning. Twice in a row last summer in July, and then he comes, he wins at Houston and now at Mexico. Uh, big wins for him, and I think so. I was going through his bag today. I put up, um, you know, what's in the bag posts on the website today, uh, and you know he's got actually a very unique mix of clubs. So he's a Ping staff member, right? He's got the G425 LST. Uh, he's got the Blueprint Irons Glide 4.0 wedges, but. What's fascinating to me is that he has the Nike Vapor Fly Pro three iron still in the bag. Um, and if you've been following him, you know that it's been in there for a while. Mm -hmm. And I believe Brooks Kepka has also been playing this club, but it has to be one of the last 
Nike clubs left on tour, I have to imagine. It was right? up there. I think Scotty Scheffler had that like Nike VR Pro right. Five he with for a while, in. but that that's been that's gone. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I can't think of another Nike club. So right, it's uh, it's fascinating. And it's 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 it, it, the club sticks out at you too. It's that black coating. You know, it, it it's one you you he pulls it out in the bag on. You know, typically it's a tee shot, mm -hmm. and you know that that's that three iron. But you don't like you do see that on tour a lot, and it might not be a Nike club, but you see guys. If they get comfortable with a club, especially in that range, the yeah. fairy wood, the hybrid, utility iron, um, they'll stick with that club for a long time. And I mean, that club is, we're getting close to eight, nine years old, and Tony seems to be sticking with it, and now he's winning with it. Yeah, I think you definitely see it. I mean, there's instances of, of players doing that with like an iron set. I think Daniel Berger is an example. He, he gamed those, yeah, those right. tailor made yeah. MCs for, for a long time. But I think in that kind of, you mentioned it's sort of that hybrid fairway wood utility iron range. Uh, you see it a lot mostly because for a lot of players, and Tony Pino is a great example, who's just an absolute bomber, they don't need distance per se. They don't need the latest and greatest um, in, in terms of, Tony Pino doesn't need any more ball speed with that three iron. Right. And so for him, it's always, it's a feel shot, it's a comfort shot. and he's clearly comfortable with right. it because uh, he's playing some pretty great golf. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you see, yeah, you see so many players that do that, and like you said, they just get comfortable with the club, and if it works for them, uh, they, they stick with it. And um, so that's, I think that speaks to his confidence with the club, and it's also his, his talent. I mean, he's able to hit any club and hit the shots he needs to um, with that. And as, as I mentioned, ball speed, too, I think Tony might be the number one guy on tour where he swings and keeps so much left in the tank yeah. with speed. <laughs> That's what you always hear, is yeah. that if he really wanted to, he could be the longest guy on yeah. tour. And I I think that speaks to him. Maybe at one point, he that's what he thought he was going to be. And then he's like, you know, I, to win out here, maybe I'll rein it back, hit some fairways, and then I'll shoot 24 under par and win the Mexico Open comfortably over the number one player in the world, which is also what we should talk about with John Rahm. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started this after Augusta, um, the show, and so we should maybe reflect on that a little bit too, but the run he's on, I saw uh, the stat yesterday uh, that if he would have been able to come back on Tony, he would have become the first player since 1974 mm -hmm. to win five times in one year before May 1st. Um, so it's not often in this day and age we get to talk about something that a golfer could have achieved that Tiger did not achieve. Mm -hmm. So uh, John Rahm's late, latest stretch, phenomenal. Uh, I mean, what have you seen from him? What do you think this could be something that you think is going to approach Tiger's status or no? Well, see, I think the, the difference between him and Tiger and the run he's been on is, is I think you could fairly say Tiger-esque. Yeah. I think the difference is what we've really seen in kind of the, the modern game, you know, maybe say the last 10, 12 years or so has been a series of players going on these kind of 18-month runs. So you saw Roy McIlroy mm -hmm. go on a, on a run in 2014. Then you saw Jordan Spieth go on a run in 2015. Then you saw Jason Day go on a run in 2016. And you kind of see these players, they, they, they burn bright for a year and a half. They pick out Brooks Kepka picked off a few mm -hmm. majors. And while they play incredible golf, no one seems to be able to, to do it for three, four years. And so you even mentioned that 1974, Johnny Miller, went on an incredible run for a couple of years. I think it was like 1973 to 1975. He won, I think it was 16 tournaments. He, basically his whole career was in three years. And whether it's, you know, career burnout, uh, maybe losing a bit of the edge, you know, losing a little bit of motivation to, to practice or just the sheer depth of the PGA mm -hmm. Tour, um, you see players that can light it up for a year and a half, two years, I'm really curious to see if John Rahm can really kind of hold on to the reins for, um, you know, a couple more years because right. that would be that would be that would put him in that kind of Tiger-ish level. Right, because that's I suppose that's kind of where he separates himself from all these other contenders. Is his stretch of dominance was, you know, years potentially, decade plus long. Right. Um, where, you know, you, like you said, these guys like even so this is Rahm's stretch here. I'm looking at his finishes from the 2022-23 season. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is Tiger-esque. Uh, he's got it, I'm going in order here, but T from, from last fall, T4, T8, win, win, T7, third, win, T39, he withdrew at the players with an illness. Uh, match play was T31, but then he won the Masters, uh, T15 at RBC Heritage, and runner-up at Mexico Open. So uh, that is a 
an impressive string. And I think if you look back at some of Tiger's best seasons, they probably start very similar to that. They do. I think Tiger's such an outlier. I yeah. mean, you see... And, I, and it's probably irresponsible of me to keep trying to draw this comparison. But, again, I think it's important to put into context what Rom has accomplished so far this year. Absolutely. And, and him and Scotty Scheffler especially. Roy McIlroy here and there. But I think Rom and Scotty have definitely been the two most consistent. Um, it's been incredibly impressive. Tiger, he won, I think six tournaments in a row twice in his yeah. career i think there was a stretch yeah. i think he had a it was like a nine month stretch in 2006 when the only tournament he lost was the Ryder cup <laughs> and there's he's kind of in his own category but in terms of the consistency scotty and, and rom are, are yeah. really impressive yeah because scotty had that stretch last basically last year at this time too where that somewhat some of these same conversations were being had about about him can he keep this up uh, so those two will probably duke it out for a while here for for that number one overall ranking mm -hmm. in, um, in the men's game. But um, one other person uh, and player I wanted to talk about as well from this event uh, was Akshay Batia. Uh, so for those who don't know who Akshay is, um, he turned pro, I believe, at 17 or 18 years old. But he didn't go to college. He didn't go to college. He turned pro right away. Um, and he's kind of been working his way mini tours to Corn Ferry Tour. Um, did, he, did he win it? He won on the Corn Ferry Tour, I believe, or finished runner-up. Um, but he's now earned a, he finished second at the Puerto Rico Open this spring to earn that sort of special temporary membership uh, with the PGA Tour. And he was, for three, basically three and a half rounds, he was contending with John Rahm and, and Tony Fino were the biggest names in this event by a you know, wide margin. Mm -hmm. And he was right there with them neck and neck for, you know, essentially 63 holes of this tournament. So, um, I mean, talk to me about your impression of Akshay and what, his future might look like as you know be becoming one of these rising stars in the game yeah i think he's going to be an interesting test case you see uh, this sort of i think you used to see it more the the not going to college going right out of high school route to the pga tour when the old q school you could get right on the tour so you'd see guys like kevin na that turned pro mm -hmm. super early now that it, you don't really see that much more anymore you see it a lot in basketball say we're now uh, you see guys going out of high school right into the G League and then going into mm -hmm. the NBA. I'm curious to see if Akshay is sort of the canary in the coal mine for maybe in five, ten years. We see a lot more players try to test the waters out of high school. Uh, this, you know, seeing Akshay compete well might incentivize companies like Titleist and Callaway and, and TaylorMade to maybe maybe realize that some of these high school guys are ready for, uh, right. for the big time. Um, so that's that's interesting. I think Akshay incredibly impressive. Uh, I love his swing. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, lefties always are, are kind of oh, fun yeah. to watch. He's just got that really languid kind of fluid motion at the ball. Um, I think he's kind of in that that mold of uh, great ball striker. I think when the putter gets hot, he'll be he'll yeah. be solid. So uh, really, yeah, really I noticed he's player. got that. He's got that kind of the is it the arm lock putter or something along those lines. I think I don't he's know been doing was, the arm yeah. lock for a while. It's, I think he's messed around with a couple yeah. different. If you, uh, if you look around the tour, I think you, you see the guys with arm lock and you're probably like, they've been through some things, changing their putter technique or their putter head or going arm lock, then they're going traditional. I, I, it seems like t typically those, those people that you are using arm lock probably had a lot of trial and error with other things. Very few people start with arm lock. Right. And it feels like... If they go to arm lock, there's a reason for it. Yeah. It's not usually yeah. what they're taught at, at age right. five. Right. So, I mean... If he gets the putter worked out, he might be a winner soon. I mean, he's got a couple really good finishes already. Um, I, I, but yeah, I, I had to ask because I think that was the point I was going to mention as well. Is so many kids they, the the, the idea is I'm going to go play college golf. I'm going to play against you know the best amateurs in the world in that regard. Most mm -hmm. of them play that Division One college golf and then work my way up to the pros. But he took a different route, kind of trusting his, you know, trusting himself really. Mm -hmm betting on himself in a way, and it's clearly worked out. So you wonder then how many of these world-class high school age players are going to make that jump instead of going to college golf. But um, worth worth noting there, I guess. Um, in the women's game now, we had a fun finish. Uh, so obviously on the Mex in the Mexico Open, we had a kind of a blowout um, in a sense. F Tony Fino had the tournament wrapped up for essentially all of Sunday afternoon. Uh, but the LA Championship, the JM Eagle LA Championship in the LPGA was... Uh, as like loaded or I guess packed together of a leaderboard mm -hmm. you could get 
we had a six-way tie for the top at one point Sunday, uh, but Hannah Green comes out on top, making a 25-footer to earn a spot in the playoff. Um, her clubs consist of a ZX7 Mark II driver, G425 Fairywoods, and hybrid ZX7 Mark II irons, RTX6 wedges, and a Ping Sigma II putter. So what a weekend for Ping. You got a Finau win, and you got uh, Hannah Green as well playing a lot of Ping in the bag. Yeah, and an appearance on the, the right, top right corner of your there shirt. There you go, yeah. Ping, I mean, ping shirt, too, on the swing on the second Swing Thoughts podcast. It's been a banner week. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, those three things all, of course, equal in terms of relevance. Uh, <laughs> but, what I mean, so I wanted to ask you about something because I thought this was quirky about the LPGA event this weekend. Um, the last hole was a par three. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was it was cool because it created some good good theater where... You know, obviously Hannah Green had to hit a really good iron shot and then make a putt to tie for the lead and eventually get into a playoff. Mm-hmm. I, you don't see a lot of courses with a par three as the last hole. What do you what do you think in general of that idea? So I, I I'm sort of of two minds. I think the fact that it was a short par three was mm-hmm. very cool. I think yeah. you know there's a real drama to you give all the players in contention. You give them a flat lie. You give them a perfect chance to fire at the pin and, and make a birdie. Um, so that's very cool. My experience with par three finishers is, is a bit more checkered. Uh, one of my first ever varsity tournaments was played at Owatonna Country Club in Minnesota, and the nine and 18 are both long par threes, and 18 Ooh. is about 180 up the hill, and my 14-year-old self had to hit a, a two hybrid with <laughs> a huge amphitheater of, of people watching. I, I pull hooked it onto mm-hmm. the practice screen and made triple. Um, so personally, uh, I, I'm sort of my knee-jerk reaction is to uh, sort of vomit in my mouth when I hear <laughs> par three finisher. But Wilshire is a fantastic course. Mm-hmm. I think giving the players a chance to really put their foot on the gas on the last hole and uh, get a wedge in their hand uh, provided for a lot of drama. Right, because I think there's there's a strategy obviously to now. Granted, if you're down by one going into the final hole, you're going to fire at the flag and right. try to make the birdie. But there's when they went to the playoff, there's that strategy of, all right, well, there's three of us in this playoff. How aggressive should I be, you know, on a shot like that? And so mm-hmm. uh, I, I just, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard of a, a, an event at this level of professional, right, the highest level of women's golf, um, finishing with a par three. So I, right. I wonder if we'll, you know, I don't know how many courses are out there that, you know, have the capability of hosting a, a large event like this, but um, maybe we'll see, maybe we'll see Wilshire um, in a men's event. Uh, mm-hmm. Big men's event soon, um, I guess. But I just I wanted to get your thoughts on that because again, that's that's so unique. And yeah, I think there's also something to the fact that it was sort of a shorter hole. I, I like that there's sort of a when the pressure is at its highest, there, it's sort of a finesse shot, yeah. which is you know you see so often, especially in the men's game, the 18th hole is a 495 yard par four. Mm-hmm. You hammer driver as hard as you can, and then you you know you hit some kind of mid iron. I, I like that when your nerves are tested those little kind of those finesse shots are what i believe are the trickiest and while it might eat you know on a wednesday that 125 yards might look really easy um with all the pressure in the world on you suddenly that kind of three-quarter touch wedge is uh is a lot tougher yeah and i think so you mentioned the par like the par fours you see on tour that are you know high 400s maybe even Mm -hmm. 500 yards that typically wrap up like on, on the 18th hole it's, I like that this hole seems to, you know, be on the border of an easy bird. Like, you're going to get a lot of birdies and a lot of pars with that distance um, and create that, you know, where it become a nice playoff hole where you have, like, on a, like on a, par, a long par four, tough par four that usually finishes a golf course, mm-hmm. you get lots of, tough to make par, a lot of bogeys, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, there's a volatility there of, of that score you're going to make, lots of fours and fives. It's not going to be a lot of players, you know, 80, 90 percent of the pair, players making one score. You're mm-hmm. going to get a, a larger spread, if you will. So um, there's a it's a different way of doing that with a short par three. But I think they accomplished that, obviously, with the way this tournament played out. And you had so many big names at the top. I know Nelly Korda played really well and was, had her name up there, which is always uh, a, a attention grabber for sure. um, especially the you know American uh, female golf followers out there. So. Um, a, a really good tournament, and we're looking more forward to the more uh, to the future majors here for the LPGA season. But um, 
I got to give cre credit to Hannah Green, not winning for about four years. She won the PGA actually when it was here um, in the, at Hazel Team yeah. uh, four years ago. And, and uh, basically that was her last win. She won like a week or two after that. Mm -hmm. And then she hadn't won since. So credit to her for, for gr grinding back, uh, you know, and, and making making a, a, the big putt when she needed to. And of course, the in a three person in, playoff, in the, win the three three way playoff. That's impressive. So um, now I wanted to get to a couple of, of fitting sort of comments and questions that we got. These are from the YouTube channel, um, a couple from the sort of videos of our podcast that are up there, by the way, if you want to watch the, the video version, um, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, of course, otherwise, you can continue listening audio on Apple, Spotify, uh, Amazon, what have you. Uh, but so and I wanted to ask you about this one because there's this, there seems to be a perception on fittings, right? So this mm -hmm. person, uh, the Ryan on YouTube asks, can someone with an 18 handicap get a fitting? And um, I think there's a perception out there that, you know, fittings are only for the better players or fittings are only for, um, you know, the, the scratch players or players taking it super seriously. But I, in talking to all the fitters at Second Swing, it's almost, they almost disagree with that completely where they say, you can actually benefit more from a fitting if you are 15, 18, 20 plus mm -hmm. handicap. Absolutely, I think, you know, and I think, yeah, they, they see second swing tour van fitting. Do, do they, I think there's a lot of people who think, you know, do I have to be at that like tour level to really benefit from it? And it's, it's exactly like you said, exactly the opposite. Um, so often in golf, it's the, the gains that can be made at the higher handicaps are pretty drastic. You can you can become go from an 18 to a 12 handicap very quickly. Now getting from a you know a two handicap to scratch is is a different story. But the the skill gains that can be made through one hour with a second swing fitter should not be overlooked. Right, and I think I think it's and again we're not I don't think we've ever tried to say that. Um, this swing doesn't matter or you know if you're a 20 or 25 handicap you won't need to change your swing to get to that single digit mark right mm -hmm. i mean we're never going to deny that teaching and, and instruction is going to be also important and learning how to hone in your swing technique is going to be important but little things like like for me for example um when i got fit for irons for the first time here it was early 2020 right before the pandemic and it was you know i was I thought I had irons that fit me because I had an iron set. I mean, why technically I was fit, but it was, you know, five, six years before that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went into this fitting and I, I was like, I feel comfortable with what I'm playing, but I just want some new clubs. These are beat up. I've used them for a lot for the last five, six years. I need some new clubs. And turns out clubs were A, too short for me. Um, they were th three degrees too flat in, in the lie angle. And so what happened was I gained 15 yards with my seven iron, um, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's someone that swings like me. That's not something I usually, that usually happens. To right. Uh, but then I also ended up playing irons that were, you know, a half inch longer. And then my grip was also, I needed a larger grip because my hands are a little bit bigger than for a standard grip. So you, if you haven't been fit before, there's like, you, you don't really understand how much you might actually need and you might be missing out on because right. then I started hitting the, like I had this right tendency and that was where that flat line angle problem was. I turned them upright, straightened out that, that face angle for me and it was night and day difference. And so, and again, that's for me, I, I speaking as a, as a better player, I guess, but I'm looking over at the tens and 15s and 20 handicaps and there's far easier tendencies to correct than what I had. I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah, fitting is definitely, golf will be hard no matter what. Yes. Golf will be hard the day before your second swing fitting, the yeah. golf will be hard the day after. What I see it as is, you know, in tennis there's the stat unforced errors. I see a second swing fitting as a great way to just get rid of all of the unforced errors. You know, your lie angle, you were you spent years playing golf every day, getting lessons, practicing, and your lie angle was always off. And so you still were able to play great golf, but there was that sort of unforced error. Mm -hmm. You now that you kind of leveled the playing field, you went out and you were able to play much great golf, much better golf right away. Right. That's not to say lessons aren't important. That's not to say practice isn't important, but it, it's amazing those little kind of gremlins that are in everyone's bag. Maybe your, your driver loft is a bit too high. Maybe your putter loft is a bit too low. Maybe your wedge gapping is off. These are, they seem like little things, yeah. but they can make a big difference. It's even like, 
like you mentioned the putter loft one, which is one that I think so many people with putters might be even a different story. Cause I know Larry, you work with him all the time. He always is just baffled by how many people will religiously get fit for drivers or irons, you know, but you use your putter 40% of the time. Um, for 40% of your shots, you're using a putter, most players, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, one thing I noticed, I was playing with a couple of friends this past weekend and every putt, the ball would bounce. You know, even if it was like a six or seven footer, the ball would bounce. And I was, I didn't want to be the, you know, the guy in the group <laughs> that's like, hey, you should work on this, you know, or you should, you should do this. But uh, he, I mean, there, that's probably a loft thing, right? Where he's probably got too low a loft and skidding off the ground and bouncing up in the air. And um, those are things that can very quickly be tweaked at second swing in the tour van. Right. And that's not a, a big two hour session, a big investment. Right. That's just taking one look in, look in the Quintech, checking the loft, checking kind of the, the, the launch angle that you're generating on the ball. It, it's a pretty easy fix, but like you said, it could affect 40% of your game. Right. And I mean, if you're missing a lot of six, seven, I mean, that's, you know, if you miss two to three, six, seven footers in your round that you could easily make, that's three shots off your stroke. That's, I mean, that's, that's a whole world of difference, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at a I don't know, 85 instead of 88. That feels a lot different to me. Uh, and I imagine it would for, for the viewers and the listeners. So um, so the next one here, this is actually an interesting discussion. Um, and I think that uh, this is Brent bringing this up. And I kind of want to A, ask what you have in the bag in this sense, but then B, I think there's a nuanced discussion that can be had here. And ultimately, as we, as we say with a lot of these discussions, it's going to be you know, you should get fit for yourself to kind of find out. But Brent is asking, should the shaft flex of your hybrid, so he's thinking about getting a hybrid and it was on a hybrid video, was this comment, but match your irons and your driver. Um, and so I guess in my experience, I have, I have a, you know, a, a enough swing speed. And I, I think I would imagine you do too, where extra stiff is probably warranted throughout the bag. But I'm curious, you know, if you've, you know, do you have extra stiff throughout the bag? And if you don't, where does that change come in? Yeah, I think I do. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's sort of the philosophy that I've always bought yeah. into. I know that's become especially a big, um, a big point of emphasis with wedges that uh, yeah. for a lot of time, manufacturers and golfers alike, both just sort of you take the wedge flex, but I think there's there's been a growing movement to hey, if you're a high swing speed player, make sure you get those those X 100s in mm -hmm. your wedges as well. So um, again, this is, it's a great conversation to have with a second swing fitter, but right. that's, that's sort of the, uh, the line of thinking I buy into is sort of the much more uniformity you can get, the better. Right. And I think, uh, cause you're, cause you're right. I think if you're, if you're not able to go to a store and get fit, I think that would be the safest option yeah. is if you have irons and driver that are the same flex, um, then you probably should go with that with your hybrid. I think that's probably what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're if you're gonna go get fit, I think there's there are some discussions to be had about like for example, if I think a lot of players, myself would be I'd be one in particular with a hybrid. Mentally, I can't quite figure out uh, a hybrid, right? Like I I have this it just I, I'm not confident with I'm hybrids, the same way. and I don't play them for that reason. Um, and so there's maybe a reason there where someone might go with a different shaft flex just because of, I mean, there's, it's, it's a nuanced conversation. People swing differently. And I think in a lot of ways, you're kind of supposed to swing differently between driver, hybrids, irons. And through that, you may deliver the club differently. So it's not, I'm, I'm not going to give the blanket statement like, yes, same shaft flex for all the clubs. But I think if you talk to a fitter and you went in through a fitting and you, I think there might be a small percentage of people that would walk out with a, let's say a stiff shaft for their hybrid and extra stiff for their irons or vice versa. Sure. I, I think, again, like we said, rules of thumb are, are helpful and, and golfers at home can, can take something from that. But what, what always kind of rings in my head when I think about this issue is uh, Larry Bobka, who was, was and still is an excellent golfer and, and really considered playing professionally for a while, uh, for a lot of his career and, and currently uses a regular flex driver. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's always exceptions, and so um, like you said, there's I, I kind of tend to buy into what you use for one, you should use for the other. But um, as we always say, coming in and, and talking to a professional is the best way to figure it out for right. sure. And I, you never know what you're going to find out is best for you. Uh, I hear it all the time. People come in and they think this is what they need. This is 
you know, I'm, I've been playing stiff shafts for 20 years. I'm, right. I'm getting a stiff shaft today. I just need to know which model. And then they end up walking out with extra stiff for some reason, right? Uh, but it's, uh, you never really know until you hit, get it and try it. You see the data for yourself and you kind of have that one-on-one -on -one discussion with the fitter to really understand what's best for your swing. And then from there, of course, that relationship starts where something's not working on the course and turns out you actually need the same flex or everything. You can go back in and make that easy switch. No big deal. So um, this last one here um, is a kind of leads into a, another discussion that I think I wanted to have because it's one of those awesome trends in golf that is, um, I think that there's a reason fittings are becoming more popular. It's because things like this are, are starting to help people play better. Mm -hmm. So this is from Jason. Um, he says, um, this is, he actually commented this on a video that was um, from a year or two ago. We were doing some testing on nine woods, nine woods versus five hybrid versus four iron. Um, but he says, I know I'm a bit late to the comments, but I did make a change last season and pulled out the four and five hybrids of, out of my bag and put in the Ping G425 seven and nine fairy woods, and I will never go back. For me, the consistency of making good contact, the forgiveness when I don't find the center, and my confidence of seeing the height you get from the fairy woods has been a game changer. Over the last five years, I went from long irons knowing I had about a 20% chance of even seeing the ball get in the air to the hybrids, which bumped it up a little bit to now about 65% with the fairy woods. So I saw, I, f I saw a few different videos of you guys making this comparison and when fitting and testing. I only wish I had tested it myself sooner. Why is it you don't, you, why is it you don't see more higher handicapped golfers going this route? Is it a price thing or do you think everyone is just building a bag kind of to what the pros have? Um, and that's kind of where that discussion comes in, mm -hmm. those questions, because now, we're not quite at the point where all these manufacturers are having, let's say, nine woods with their sort of new releases, but seven woods are there on basically every new fairy wood series of, of launch. You get the seven wood at 21, 22 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and I will echo what he said in terms of the performance of the clubs. Se like seven woods are going to launch higher. They're going to be more forgiving. Uh, they're going to land softer than three iron or any hybrid, any hybrid of comparable lofts. So um, I guess now, I, I don't know, I don't think you play a seven wood in your bag necessarily, but I guess in, in your experience with other players, what is the benefit that you've seen from higher lofted fairy woods? So I'm, this is really interesting because not too long ago, I remember, I think Tiger Woods put his five wood in around 2008. And I remember he would joke with Marco Mira, call it his old man club. And so in 2008, the five wood was like this anomaly. Mm -hmm. Now everyone has a five wood. And then a few years ago, you know, Max Homa, Dustin Johnson, these guys put the seven wood in the bag and it's like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Now you see they're a lot more widespread. Now you see Tommy Fleetwood putting a nine wood in the bag. And I, I think you see that kind of, that, that creep starts in the professional game and then I think it sort of trickles down. Um, I don't personally play one, although my dad over the off season did get a TSI two seven wood and a G425 nine wood and uh, he could not be more happy with them. I played with him last week. He hit the seven wood into a long par three in wind in off the left. He hit a cut that it, oh, it goes yeah. a bit higher than a three iron wood, but because oh, yeah. he hits it so much more solidly, it still bores through the wind and he's, he couldn't be happier. Right. And I think uh, you're, you're really starting to see, again, I think it always, a lot of equipment trends start with the professionals and go down and uh, the way things are moving, I, I think they're gonna get more and more popular. I think we absolutely, if there is any shaming of high lofted fairy woods, we definitely do not condone it. I think absolutely that would be the not. official second swing stance is we do not condone any shaming of high lofted fairy woods. And actually we're probably the opposite. We encourage you to play them, um, especially if you, if you struggle with the top of the bag at all. I mean, and it might be for you, it actually might be not having a three wood in the bag. It might just be five wood and nine wood, or it might be five wood and seven wood, whatever it might be. But I mean, I can't in the, there's a few videos on our YouTube channel, you can go check them out, where we've tested seven woods, nine woods against, you know, their counterparts of equal loft, right? Mm -hmm. So a three iron or a, you know, a five hybrid or whatever it might be. And I mean, the, the, the shallower face of the fairy wood brings down the center of gravity, kind of lower below the golf ball. And so what that does is, you know, it, it launches that ball way higher than an iron. And so if you're the person struggling getting these longer clubs off the ground, which I know is a common issue, mm -hmm. 
the seven wood and nine wood, throwing those in the bag, taking out, and maybe starting your iron set at seven iron or six iron um, is going to help you a ton. And so um, c credit to Jason here for making that switch and kind of committing to that. And he even mentioned too, he's like, you know, you know, I get some weird looks for having these clubs in my bag, but it works for me. And that's totally true. I mean, ultimately we're just trying to help people play the clubs that help them the most. And seven woods and nine woods need to be in more bags. Our fitters are getting a ton of them into bags this year and they keep telling me all the time, you know, there's another seven wood today, or I did both a seven wood and nine wood today. Um, and so if, if you feel like you're one of those players struggling there, I, I really think this would be a, a, a great option. It's something that, you know, I know I've seen in, in a few of my friends too. It's something similar to what your dad's experienced. Yeah, and again, my dad's a, he's a pretty good player. He's probably a five handicap. It's not, it's not even necessarily you should get a seven wood if you're a high handicap. Right. It's just for my dad and for me, we both look down at a hybrid and it's just, whether it's the alignment, we, we, we just not super comfortable. I always hit hybrids left for some reason. And so maybe you're a scratch golfer and you, you know, you want to yeah. hit so many long par threes or, or so many par threes are in that kind of, you know, 220 range. That's a great option for that. So uh, whatever handicap you are, kind of wherever you're at, uh, I would not, uh, I would not look past those kind of higher lofted fairway medals. Right. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. And, um, you know, I've actually played a little bit around with the seven wood I have myself. Um, Cause it depends for me. I mean, there's, so the, the, the pro player, first of all, the fact that you even mentioned pro players putting it in the bag should sort of eliminate this whole discussion about you know, handicap and, and things like that. If you have Tommy Fleetwood throwing a nine wood in the bag and you have Dustin Johnson, Max Homa, Tyrrell Hat, and all these guys throwing seven woods in the bag um, and they are the best players in the world. I think that eliminates that conversation, uh, you know, entirely but you know there's stigmas that stick around sure. and so i think that's where we're at and maybe tiger is maybe at fault for that with those early comments with the five wood but <laughs> potentially yeah but um I, I think you know again we've talked a lot about fitting here with these questions but there's a lot of good that can be had by throwing a seven wood or a nine wood in the bag it can really help your game um so wanted to end with that one um but michael uh we'll do a lot more of these i know we were we uh we we had some fun golf tournaments over the weekend. Um, we had some pretty good questions that we found here from the YouTube comments. If you guys have any questions, of course, or thoughts on your game, maybe send us the clubs you're playing. Um, we'll give our take on them. But uh, of course, you can comment on um, our YouTube channel video, or you can uh, send us messages on any of our social media channels, and we'll get to those. Uh, but Michael, thanks for joining. Uh, viewers, listeners, uh, stay tuned for more episodes of Second Swing Thoughts. Um, Make sure you subscribe and follow on, of course, YouTube, uh, Amazon, Apple, and Spotify. And we'll see you next time for episode four.